area and get to the eventual. So thank you very much for uh, coming to hear me talk. This is actually my first physical conference in a little over two years, so I had to learn how to travel again and learn all the new rules. That was always that was a bit fun, I guess. I won't, I'll call it fun. That's okay. So what I'd like to do today is walk you through uh, the discipline agile vision for where PMOs are going, or at least where they should be going. And I will uh, I'll walk you through the logic of this and. Uh, why this is important. I hope this is important, at least. So as you heard, uh, along with Mark Lyons, I'm one of the co-creators of the Discipline Agile Toolkit. Uh, DA has been around uh, a little over a decade now, I guess, and uh, was is now uh, within PMI, as we all know. Uh, my main goal, or my main job, is to lead the development, lead the evolution of the toolkit itself. And we're going to see a little bit of information out of the toolkit today and a few ideas that are in it. So I'm going to start uh, by a brief description of PMOs. And I, I should also say I'm really impressed with, what, with the agenda for this event for the next two days. I was uh, going through it uh, a few days ago just to do a reality check against what I'm presenting and what other people are presenting because uh, it's always nice if there's consistency and there seems to be. So we'll have to see you over the next two days. Uh, so hopefully for uh, a fair number of the speakers, I'm, I'm getting, uh, I'm laying the groundwork for some of your messaging. Or maybe I'm saying the exact opposite. We'll see. <laughs> That's always the problem. But uh, it's always good. Uh, different, differences of opinions are uh, actually quite important. So I'm going to start with a brief description of PMOs and uh, where we seem to be. Then I'm going to get uh, into some industry trends. And uh, this will be where I have some, I hope, to have some audience participation. Because I'm a firm believer in, uh, in actually asking people what they're doing as opposed to telling them what I think they should be doing. Uh, it keeps, uh, brings reality to my conversation. And then I'll get into uh, value delivery offices or value management offices, depending on uh, the terminology you prefer. Uh, I prefer VDO because I distinguish between managing and doing. Ooh, that's harsh. Uh, I want to get it done. There's a big difference sometimes. Right? So I'm, I'm often concerned when I hear terms about like you know risk management. I prefer addressing risk rather than just managing risk, for example. Uh, so it's a slight difference of opinion, but it, it does, does count. Uh, because you can manage things and they still go poorly. So hey, I, I want to make sure that they, the things actually get done the way they should be, you know, successfully. So what's a PMO? You know, yeah. And this is this is interesting because you ask ten different people what a PMO is, and you're going to get ten different answers. So I'll uh, I'll give you multiple answers as well because that's, that's the way I am. Uh, when you get into discipline agile, we'll see that uh, context counts. So different organizations will approach a PMO in different ways, and that's okay, right? It really does count. Uh, a PMO at an a, a aircraft company will be very different than a PMO at a software company, for example. So sometimes project management offices are involved with strategy, corporate strategy, organizational strategy, whatever you want to call that, uh, particularly when they're identifying projects. They're often responsible for portfolio management, or at least some aspects of portfolio management. That will be a big theme today, too. It's not just about projects, and it never was. Governance. PMOs are often involved with governance, or at least some aspects of governance. So you might be involved with financial governance and project governance, but you might not be involved with security governance or data governance. And maybe you should be. Or maybe you shouldn't be. I don't know. It depends. You're often involved with program management as well. Some organizations have programs, some do not. It depends. And the PMOs are often involved. But what about other things that might not be in some of the standards? Well, even though PMOs are often involved, involved with identifying projects, 
What about products? What about services? Many of you work for companies that offer products in the marketplace. Are you involved with that? Or are you merely involved with projects that might touch on the products? It's hard to say those two words in the same sentence. Give it a try. <laughs> That's um, what about on ongoing operations? Many PMOs are involved with the new aspects, you know, the upcoming and the new aspects, the planning aspects of portfolios. But then once things, once the pro once the projects are done and things move into IT operations and the business operations, the, pro the program, the uh, PMO is no longer involved because it's not projects anymore. But maybe you should be. I don't know. As I say with governance, you might be involved with project governance, but are you involved with the other aspects of governance? Do those aspects fit together? One of the very big challenges in organizations is the governance efforts tend to be a bit dysfunctional and a bit disjoint. The data folks are doing a great job of data governance, the security folks are doing a great job of security governance, the project folks are doing a great job of project governance, the finance folks are doing a great job of finance governance. But God help you, if you're on the receiving end of all of this. <laughs> yeah, the project managers in the audience are on the, yeah. Yeah. Right? Let well, alone the rest of the people on your team, which might not, might not be as patient <coughs> with the government folks. And of course, we've got program management. What about program architecture? What about the product ownership? Like the business aspects of it, the, art, you know, the technical aspects of it, not just the management aspects of it. As I said earlier, I'm often concerned with the word management. I'd rather focus on the full picture, which management's often responsible for, or at least partially responsible for. So anyways, there's a lot of opportunity for what project management offices might be doing. But it's also interesting, when you look at this list and start asking the really harsh questions, where is value being potentially generated? It might, you know, might not be generating value, but let's assume they're doing a good job. Some aspects are focused on value generation, the rest, uh, maybe not. So that's sort of iffy. So recently, we published a report on project management offices. And what we found is the top 10% of organizations are doing these things well. Governance, iteration alignment, processes, uh, technical issues, dealing with the data stuff. Data is the lifeblood of your organizations. But it's only a part of your organization. One of the challenges with the data management community is well, they're focused on data, which is great. And data is the lifeblood of your organization. But if you've only got the lifeblood and you're ignoring all the other issues, you've got a crime scene. <coughs> For those of you like CSI Miami and all those good shows. And of course, people. All your, all your HR challenges are hopefully advantages, at least advantages to the top 10% of organizations. It's also interesting to compare the top 10% with the rest of the crowd. Top 10% are very good at adopting new ways of working. It's a phenomenally well-written book from PMI called Choose Your Wow, Choose Your Ways of Working. And I want to uh, download free of charge if you're a PMI member. Enhanced uh, risk management, or addressing risk, as I like to say, which doesn't float off the tongue well, unfortunately. And the best, better organizations are using the pandemic, the lessons we've learned from the pandemic, to actually succeed. And we saw this, um, particularly a couple of years ago. Uh, remember when the pandemic first hit? And some organizations ran into, trouble, ran into very serious trouble, but other organizations thrived. They stepped up. They got the job done. A lot of it was because they were already agile organizations. They had a good infrastructure in place. They were able to pivot on a dime. They weren't doing annual planning and annual budgeting and all these other things that are holding the rest of you back. Suckers games, for the most part. And they reacted. They make grotesque amounts of money in some cases. Be not, we're all, now we're all going after the billionaires. But <laughs> it's okay. That'll teach them. They should have told us what they were making. Um, <laughs> get them. Get them. That's okay. Oh, we also.
also saw was that 92% in the top 10%, 92% of them are continually adapting their ways of working. They're continually learning, continually improving. This will be a big theme later on. Your situation is constantly evolving. You're constantly learning. The gentlemen that were on the stage before me, they were talking about the need to be constantly learning, constantly, you know, constantly update, updating your education, updating your, your knowledge. Same thing at the organization level. You've got to be constantly adapting your way of working. And you have to have fit for purpose ways of working. Look around you in this audience. You're all unique. I can say the exact same thing about your organization. No, absolutely nothing about your organization. I, can, I would put any amount of money on the fact that your staff are all unique individuals, your teams are unique, and your organizations themselves are unique. So you need to work in unique ways. One size does not fit all. So my team will work differently than your team because we're different people in a different situation. My team will learn at a different rate and will learn different things than your team, and that's okay. So we've got to be constantly improving our skills, constantly adapting, constantly getting better, constantly experimenting. Experimentation is your friend. A lot of you work in organizations, I mean some of you do, where experiment is a swear word. Because the problem with experiments is sometimes they fail. And we're not allowed to have failure here. Those organizations are failing. If you can't tolerate failure, by definition, you are a failure. Your organization is failing if you're not experimenting, if you're not learning. You might not know it, but you're not taking the risks that you need to take in order, in order to get ahead. And your competition is. And that's why they're eating your lunch. In many industries now, the top leader in that industry is up to two orders of magnitude more effective than the bottom of the industry. Up to 100 times more effective. Can you imagine trying to compete against an organization that's 100 times more effective than yours? Good luck. Or trying to compete against Amazon or eBay. Remember like 20, 30 years ago when you could scare people by saying, can you imagine what would happen if you had to compete against Microsoft? Now you'd say, well, can you imagine what would happen if you had to compete against Amazon? How many months do you think you're going you're to survive? Unless, of course, they buy you out, but, you know, <laughs> is that survival? I don't know. Uh, but anyways, so trend, trend number one. Let's talk about some trends. How many people here work in an organization right now where, you, where your senior management is talking about enterprise, being enterprise Agile, or business agility, enterprise agility, same basic term. See your hands. Wow, some of you, not all of you. How many, how many say the same thing five years ago? No, oh, okay, that's a trend, right? Five years ago, nothing. Now, something. Okay, if you're not talking about enterprise agility, I don't know what, you know, you're paying attention maybe. Okay, so, this but Agile, is all about enabling enterprise agility. An important part of it is the mindset. When you talk to agilists, they'll often tell you, agile is all about the mindset. It's all about being agile. Yeah, that's mostly true. It's also about doing. You know, I think the mindset is great, but if you don't have the skills to do the job, well, you know, you can't do the job, right? So, um, and it can take time to learn a few things. But, start with mindset. So, in DA, we stepped back several years ago, and the challenge in the excuse me, the challenge in the agile community is that many people will point to the agile manifesto, or more accurately, the manifesto for agile software development that was written in 2001, and that's a wonderful artifact. I I love it. Probably the most important thing published in the software engineering world ever and probably will be, historically, the most important thing ever published. That's where my money is. Certainly in my lifetime, that seems to be the case. Wonderful thing. Everyone points to it. But, a few problems. First, a little over 20 years old. We've learned a few things. It solved the, the software development problems of 20 years ago, which are mostly solved in modern organizations. So it's a solution to a problem we no longer have. Wonderful solution, don't get me wrong, but get old. And second, its focus was on software development, not on what we're actually trying to achieve, which is business agility. 
So the PMI, we stepped back a few years ago, and we asked ourselves, knowing what we know today, knowing that we have a different scope, how do we capture the mindset? So a bunch of us got together, very experienced people, several hundred years of experience um, in the room when we were doing this. It took us a while, but this is what we came up with. So we believe in a collection of principles. We believe that context counts, that you want to be pragmatic, you want to optimize flow, you want to be enterprise aware, do what's right for your organization, not just what's convenient for your team. This is one of the, one of the areas I think the Agile folks didn't get it right. They're very team focused and Agile, but we should really be doing this right for the organization, have a longer term vision, as well as the short term vision, of course. So because we believe in these principles, we make promises, both to ourselves and to the people that we work with, Here's how we're going to behave. Here's how we're going to interact with you. And in order to fulfill these principles, we follow a collection of guidelines. Now, for those of you familiar with lean, the very first thing you're going to notice is, gee, this is about 70 or 80% lean. Yeah, you bet. Lean is what scales agile. Or lean thinking is what scales agile thinking. That'd be a better way of looking at that. But there's some interesting implications for management and for transformations. One of them, one of my favorites is, if you want to change your organizational culture, you do it by improving your behavior. You improve it by changing the system and the way that you work, not by changing, not by actively going after the culture. Culture follows behavior. So that's a lesson you might, you might want to take home with you for those of you working in organizations that are currently doing transformations, digital transformations or agile transformations or whatever you're trying to transform. You're probably dealing with cultural issues. And the only way you can deal with a cultural issue is by changing behavior. But anyways, there's a lot of great ideas there. That's uh, one of my favorites, I guess you would say. So this mindset forms a foundation for Enterprise Agile. Then, it's not, as I said, it's not just about being Agile. It's also about doing Agile. So the toolkit is organized into four layers. A foundational layer where all the common stuff is, the mindset, the uh, fundamentals of Agile and Lean, serial, traditional stuff as well. So discipline Agile is a bit misnamed. It's really a hybrid. It's all about being pragmatic and flexible, about doing the right thing in the right situ in the situation that you face. Sometimes that's Agile, sometimes it might be a reasonably traditional way of working. Do the best that you can. Do what's right for you, fit for purpose approach. And of course, you know, people, you know, roles and teams, and of course, the way of working. And how do we choose our way of working for our situation? Building upon that is discipline DevOps. DevOps, fundamental modern IT stuff, is table stakes for a modern organization. Even the most traditional organizations like construction firms building houses and buildings and highways and good stuff like that still have IT as their backbone. Usually that's their primary competitive advantage or disadvantage depending on uh, how things are going for them. Not the way that they pour concrete. So in Discipline Agile, we always looked at the bigger picture. It wasn't just about software development and operations, which is, you know, whenever we see the figure eight picture, that's usually what people are focused on. That's also about security. For years, people have been talking about DevSecOps, how do you bring security into the picture? That's very important, don't get me wrong. The smarter organizations are now also talking about Dev Data Ops or Data DevOps. And we can really figure out what that term has to be because it's clunky no matter how you say it. <laughs> but anyways, I like data DevOps. How do you bring the data management stuff in? Because it's no good releasing code into, your, into, into production several times a day if you can't change your databases. Right? I should be able to go into your organization and ask for a change in your production tables right now this morning and expect that change to be deployed this afternoon. If you can't do that, you got a problem. And I know many organizations that can pull it off. This is not magic, this is not fantasy stuff, regardless of what your data people might say. <laughs> I 
as you can probably tell, I've got a bit of a data background. I love beating up on the data folks, because they got it done. Um, but anyways, a lot of room for improvement in the data world. That's a nice way to say it. Um, and don't let them tell you any different. How do you, how do you support? How do you help desk stuff and support stuff when you have hundreds or thousands of systems in flight? Not just about you, know, you build it, you run it type stuff, which is a great idea, but it doesn't scale. How do you release in a production when I have hundreds of teams, maybe thousands of teams, who are daily pushing code in a production? How do I do that and not have them step on each other's feet? And how do I do it at scale? Because the last thing I want are hundreds of teams figuring out the uh, CD, CI CD pipeline. And I appreciate I've gone off into techie land on many of you. If you don't know what I'm talking about, I think there's an education opportunity for you at UT Dallas. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm actually, you know what? I'm serious about that. If you're a manager in a modern organization and you don't have an IT background, if I'm throwing around terms you don't understand, you're part of the problem. <laughs> Feel free to quote me on that. You're part of the problem. It should no longer be acceptable. I get this was the 1980s, fine. I would expect running into executives without a clue. It's not acceptable today. It really isn't. It really isn't. You've got to get over your... These, many of you know what I'm talking about. But some of you, just prejudices against the IT stuff, it's not helping you. It really isn't. Uh, but anyways, a lot of good stuff there if you're interested. Building upon DevOps or value streams. How do we bring products and services to our customers? Or in the case of government agencies, to, to our, good, our good citizens, right? And how do we do it effectively? How does it all fit together? And it's not a project. It's not a project. Can't possibly be a project. Because value streams never end. If you're doing it right, <laughs> if they end, you've got a problem. Uh, or if they end unnaturally, you've got a problem. Uh, value streams begin, end, and hopefully continue with your customers. I want to continue bringing products and services and improvements to my customer base constantly. It's not a one-shot deal. It really isn't. How do you do that? That's a big problem. We'll talk about that in a bit. And of course, the rest of the organization. How do we do finance in an effective manner? People management, HR, better management, procurement stuff. There's a hopefully good talk on that later on today. Right? Now, the interesting thing, a couple of interesting things about this diagram. So these hexes are what we call process blades or process areas. Each of those groups, each of those areas can improve. I don't care how, they, how good they are in your organization, there's always room for improvement. And they'll be improving in different ways. The way that I improve a software team, if that worked, just when I to deliberate, is very different than the way I improve a finance team. Right? What's also interesting is that these groups of people come to the table with different mindsets, different priorities, different backgrounds. This is inherently true, we know this. So on the previous slide, where I was talking about mindset, blah, 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 mindset, agile guy, right? Blah, 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 mindset, be agile, blah, blah, blah. <laughs> that crap doesn't work. Because the finance people don't think that way. The data people don't think that way. The security people don't think that way. They think in different ways. The finance people, they might, you know, yes, the foundation mindset is good, but finance people have a different set of priorities, money stuff, than the security people do, security stuff. And the procurement people do, procurement stuff, and so on. We know this as professionals, it's inherently true. So how the heck? Could I possibly interact with people in these different areas if I don't have a handle on their lingo? If I don't have a handle on their priorities? So if I'm interacting with a finance team for the very first time, I probably don't know what I'm doing, right? So the toolkit, we bake in this stuff. We'll see an example of this in a bit. 
But this is something we need to appreciate. One size does not fit all. This is one of the reasons why we've got to look beyond software development when we're talking about Agile. And we've got to look beyond project management when we're talking about how we can be effective in our PMOs or whatever PMO should be evolving into. Okay, another question. How many people here are working in organizations where you've got some Agile stuff going on, some not so Agile stuff going on, and you're combining the two, you're taking a flexible hybrid approach? How many people were doing that five years ago? Yeah. Many of you, not so many though, right? Not as many, so trending, right? Not as much five years ago, much more five years, much more right now, probably even more five years from now. That's a platypus for those of you who don't know. The interesting thing about platypuses is when they were first discovered by Europeans, I guess in the 17 or 1800s, they were, one of them was brought back dead uh, to England. And there was a great hullabaloo. Because it was obviously not real. Look at it, that's ridiculous. That's like a duck combined with a beaver and who else knows? And, it, and there was great debates and there were people trying to prove that this thing was, that this you know, platypus that had been brought back was fake and there was, it was dissected and all that sort of stuff because it was, it was a hybrid, which couldn't possibly work. And yet it did. So, why is this important? So, DA is a toolkit, it's not a framework. We don't tell you what to do. All frameworks do. Scrum tells you what to do, it's prescriptive. And that's great, it solves a certain problem, good for it, but it's prescriptive. So is safe, so is less, so is nexus, so is other, and that's good. They solve a certain problem in a certain way, they tell you they've got best practices, follow these best practices, and things will be fine. But unfortunately, you're unique. You face a different problem than what somebody else's team faces, than what you know, the team's faith were faced by the people that created the frameworks. You need to tailor your way of working. You need to be able to choose your own way of working. So you might start with safe or strong or less as a foundation, but you got to tailor it from there. Do you have those skills? So in DA, instead of telling you what to do, we tell you what to think about. And then we give you options. And we tell you the trade-offs of those options. So that way you can choose intelligently ways of working to experiment with to see if they work for you in your situation. So instead of just waving our hands and say, hey, it's the art of the possible, do twice the work in half the time, marketing, marketing, spin, 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 we instead give you the skills. We teach you the skills to do what they're spinning on. So in many ways, discipline agile is an umbrella. There's roughly 1,600 techniques right now in the toolkit. It's constantly um, improving, <coughs> and the idea it's just like when, tonight when you go. Excuse me. Tonight when you go home to make dinner for your family, you'll go to the pantry and you'll pick ingredients out of the pantry, out of your fridge, cook them up, and serve dinner. Tomorrow night you'll go to the pantry in your fridge and get different ingredients, cook them up, and serve a different dinner. Same sort of thing on your teams. The finance team will pick a collection of practices, put them together and do some sort of financing thing with it. A software team will pick a, pick a bunch of practices, put it together, and do some sort of software thing with them. And so on, my software team, which is a different way of working than your software team, because we're different people doing different things, with different backgrounds, and different preferences. So fair enough. But how do we do this effectively? Because context counts. Different teams are in different situations. So for years, we've been talking about scaling Agile. And we often think about scaling in terms of team size. You know, really big teams versus very small teams. And certainly that's a scaling factor. But you know what, so is regulatory compliance. A team that has no compliance issues whatsoever will work in a different way than a team that's doing life critical compliance, right? A team taking on a simple problem will work in a different way than a team taking on a very complex problem. A team that, ha that is a small startup, and maybe a small startup even within your insurance company, work in a very different way than a team that is a coalition 
of multiple organizations, right? Different complexities there. Different teams in different situations will work in different ways. What's interesting is when I show that chart to executives like, at medium to large organizations, the only response that I've ever gotten is, oh, we've got all of this. And that's true. You have small teams and large teams. You have some, I, I don't care, you could be, I've worked in medical device companies doing agile, building medical, building pacemakers, building medical devices using agile techniques. That company, in an existential, life critical, situ in regulatory situation, also had non-regulatory projects underway as well. Fair enough, right? So a process, a way of working that makes sense for team building pacemakers is the kiss of death for, for the team that's building the internal website for your company, right? The process that makes sense for the team building the website would also be the kiss of death for the pacemaker, folks, but in the negative sense, <laughs> yeah, in you know, the bad sense of that word, that term. So we got an issue there, right? Different teams are working different ways. That's okay. Next question, I sort of asked this before, but uh, I'll be more specific this time. How many people here work in an organization where you've got some agile project, or some agile teams, some lean teams, and some traditional teams, still you know, taking a serial prescriptive predictive approach, whatever you want to call it? Right now, yeah, that's normal. Fair enough. This is a picture uh, from my, my hometown of Toronto, and the thing that I like about this is it shows a hybrid organization. Sort of. Uh, here we have an old bank building made in the built in the late 1800s. This is a building built in the late 80s, the late 80s, early 90s. This is actually off the base of an office tower. In between is this uh, architectural scaffolding. This here used to be an alley just filthy, disgusting alley. Um, now it's indoor mall. Um, for those of you who are sci-fi fans, this is actually uh, uh, used in, in several uh, science fiction films as the evil headquarters. Um, but uh, Tom, uh, Tom Cruise has filmed a few things here, but, uh, and a few others, but that's okay. The, uh, but the interesting thing about this is you've got the old, you've got the new, and you've got this scaffolding in between. This is the situation we face in organizations, right? We've got legacy stuff, we've got older ways of working, which are totally appropriate for those situations. But we've got newer stuff too, and the people leading need to be able to connect the two. I need to be able to lead the traditional teams, and lead the, the agile teams, and lead the, the, the lean teams, the service teams, and the product teams. That's reality on the ground. So these hybrids. So teams need a fit for purpose approach. So in DA, we support multiple ways of working, multiple life cycle. So we have an agile project life cycle, as well as an agile product or service team life cycle. So where the, the project team might you know, get the job done in three to six months and release something in the marketplace, the continuous delivery agile team might be releasing every Friday in your production. I've worked in insurance companies where we've taken agile teams that were lucky to release once every six months when everything, you know, all the plans aligned and things worked out well and spreadsheets were filled in properly and all that good sort of stuff, and quickly evolved them so they were releasing successfully into production every Friday morning, smoking the competitors, at least the competitors internally. Those are both, those life cycles are both based on Scrum. We also support a lean project life cycle and a lean product or service team life cycle. Um, that to me, uh, this life cycle here is pretty much pure DevOps. So remember the DevOps people are telling you here's all the awesome things they can do. Uh, so for example, if this is a software team, I would expect them to be releasing into production several times a day, thinking nothing of it. And that would be your lowest risk team in your organization, by the way. The traditional teams would be your highest risk teams. But it is what it is. Is the only way you can release some production several times a day is you've got to interact together. You have to completely and utterly de-risk and de-cost everything. So those are based, both based on Kanban, project life cycles, product or service team life cycles, or long-standing team life cycles, different terms. 
Um, the same concept, there's no consistency in the marketplace, unfortunately. We support an exploratory lean startup based process. So how do you explore a new product or new service concepts? How do you take the risk out of new product ideas? Completely based on lean startup. The actual lean startup community the last few years have been focusing on how do we do this um, internally within like the insurance companies of the world, the banks of the world, uh, auto manufacturers of the world. Um, we've been doing DA a little bit longer than that. Um, that's just where our customers were. Of course, the program life cycle, how do you run an initiative of initiatives? It's not a project of projects. It's not just about projects, right? And we're in the process of adding a serial traditional more life cycle, as well as a citizen development, do-it-yourself type of a life cycle. Okay? Now, a couple interesting things on this slide. The main one, not just about projects. And it never was. How many, yeah, I've already asked this question, right? You've seen it. Your colleagues are working organizations with multiple ways of working, and that's okay. But you know what? If you're working in a PMO, you still gotta lead, you still gotta govern these things. And the way that I lead an agile projects team is very different than the way I would lead and govern a continuous delivery lean team, which is different yet again than how I do it for a serial team. A governance process that makes sense for one of those would be bad news for all the others. Got to be flexible. So if you have one official way of doing things, everybody has to follow the, go jump through these quality gates and fill out these templates, and not governance. That is not governance. That is useless bureaucracy. It's a big difference. And you're rejecting cost and risk, by the way, when you do that. You're not governing, you're not getting the real job done, and you're actually anti-governing. And that's okay. We can get better. Here's an example. This is pulled straight out of our Agile metrics. Uh, so it's not just about Agile metrics, but anyways, straight out of our Agile metrics microcredit BMI. Uh, so here we have a, a, a trucking company. They have many projects underway, or many efforts and many initiatives underway. Here's three of them. We've got a software project underway. We've got a rollout new equipment into the trucks project underway. And there's different trucks and different equipment. And, you know, different trucks are built at different times, you know, or purchased at different times with different vendors and all that sort of stuff. Zero consistency. Because it's trucking, that's the way you would do it. <laughs> uh, and of course we have a you know construction project underway. Three very different projects. Yet the PMO. Needs to, needs to guide and manage these things. All right. uh, so we have an issue here. Another trend, projects to product. Uh, but by the way, I'll give you a solution, well, a potential solution, I don't want to say the solution, but a potential way that we can measure those three things different and roll the metrics up. Because you, you don't want to inflict the same metrics on all those teams. The way I can measure quality, I'll give you the hint, I can measure quality on all three of those teams. But the way that I measure quality in a software team is spectacularly different than the way I measure quality on a building team. Right? Think about that. So, we'll walk you through later. Okay, project to product. Here's an existential threat trend for us. How many people here are working in organizations right now today where, the, particularly the IT people probably, are throwing around this term, projects to product. A few? Same question for five years ago. Yeah, so oh, one or two, okay. Cool. Yeah, we would have been about five years ago when it started. So what's happening here is we're seeing this trend where instead of running project teams, we're keeping the teams together. So the Microsoft Word, for example, that's not a project. That's a long-standing product team. It's been running 30 some odd years, 40 years, I don't know. A long time, right? In the intangible space, where you're dealing with bits, where you're dealing with you know, ones and zeros, this is a trend. In the tangible space, where you're dealing with atoms, like you're building buildings, this is still a trend, but not as big. So for example, companies will build a building like this, 
but then they will continue on to maintain and operate that building and evolve it over time. Because companies have realized it's not just about a construction project, and sure there's good money in that if you do it right, but there's more money to be made running the buildings. It's the smart people. So this building is not a project. Never was. Well, I guess it was at some point. Certainly isn't today. This is a long-term service engagement with maybe the occasional construction effort to fix things, which may or may not be projects depending on the, on the complexity. So we're see, certainly seeing this in the intangible space, also seeing it in tangible. So what do I mean by this? So here we have, this is the, the high level agile project life cycle, three phase approach. In DA, the terms serial and phase are not swear words, either is governance. But anyway, so if you're running an agile project, it's like this. You got to use some sort of inception initiation effort, do the work, wrap it up, right? Deliver. Pretty basic. But then you keep the team together. You don't disperse them. Because if I'm building an IT product, if I'm building or, you know, any sort of intangible thing, more than likely, we got to continue on, right? We're going to do release three, or release four, or release five, and so on. So we keep the team together. In Agile, we talk about shifting right and shifting left. Thinking activities, such as modeling and planning, are so important to us, we do them every single day. Not just trivial phases we do up front, but we do them all the way through the life cycle. Similarly, quality activities are so important to us, we do them every single day. We do them almost from the very beginning. Because I want to reduce the feedback cycle. I want to, I want to dramatically re reduce the cost of addressing problems. I don't want to get surprised at the end of a project to find out my system doesn't integrate. People are laughing. And you know what? If you were fresh out of school, in your early 20s, you don't really have a clue, Okay, fine, right? But if you're a little bit older, and you're still running projects... Senior, not older. Senior! <laughs> may not be better. More experienced. More experienced, says the younger one in the audience. Anyways... It's always the young ones that can't get a handle on their age. Uh, embrace it. Okay. If you're still getting surprised in the integration testing, come on. It's your fifth or sixth IT project and you're still getting burned in integration testing? Because you're not testing up front. Testing phases are not the way to go. It's something we've known in the IT world for since at least the 80s. Probably the 70s to the truth. Um, so we want to keep the team together. So we do this. So I do the project, and I go in to take the same team, go to the next release. The inception phase, initiation phase, shrinks all by itself. Because during inception, well, what do you do? You put the team together, you do some initial scoping, you do some initial architecture, you do some initial planning, you go hat in hand looking for money, you, Get the, you, know, you get your stakeholders together, you get them to you know, get them to agree on where the heck you're going. Easier said than done sometimes. But now I've kept the team together, I don't have to do that. The team's together, I don't have to reform them. I know what the scope is, is whatever I didn't get done. Duh. I know what the architecture is, is whatever's up and running. Hardcore reality, right? Planning, eh, might have to do a little bit of thinking, yeah, yeah, we want to release at the end of the quarter, whatever, right? So inception shrinks all by itself because you don't need to do that work anymore because you kept the team together. You can reduce your management overhead, reduce your risk, reduce your cost. That's not such a bad idea. No wonder this is a trend. Transition starts to go away through automation because now my team, if it's not a project, if it's a project team, I don't really care. Sorry, folks. If I'm on an IT project, I don't really care about the organization. I just want to hit my day and want to get the job done. I'm not going to invest in automation because I'm not ever going to have to, I'm not going to get advantage of that. But if I keep the team together, now I'm highly motivated to automate my testing, to automate my deployment, because all this transition stuff, not fun. 
People don't like that stuff. I want to automate it away. I want to be able to push a button, get it done. Or not even push a button if I'm smart. Have it done automatically for free. So I keep the team together. Inception keeps shrinking. By the third or fourth release, it's pretty much gone. Transition keeps shrinking through hard work. Hard work and investment. There's no, there's no easy answer on that one. It's just get her done. And so finally, I'm releasing costly. So earlier I was telling you about that agile project team that you know, went from a six month releases to releasing every Friday like that. Pretty sweet. So it's low risk now. It's a no brainer. All your planning overhead goes away, right? What are you, you going to release? We're releasing at 9 a.m. on Friday. When's your next release? 9 a.m. the following Friday. What about the next release? 9 a.m. the Friday after that. And eventually the execs clue to the pattern, right? Forecasting, also trivial. I know what my cost is, I know what my, my schedule is, because it's regular. Got rid of all that overhead. Very sweet. Another trend, value streams. How many people here in the organization talk about value streams now? Yeah, five years ago. A few? Okay, cool, yeah. Uh, value streams have been around for a few decades. So. <laughs> but they are becoming popular now, that's good. Okay, so a value stream is the end-to-end -end effort. Starting, ending, and hopefully continuing with your customers. This is the way we bring products and services to market. Bring va real value to the customer. Value is achieved when you have stuff or services in the hands of your customer. Up until that point, and, and they're getting value, and they, they like it, they're getting value from it. Up until then, it's only potential value. No value has been earned until it's been earned. So releasing something on time to budget on time, on budget, spec, and nobody uses it, exactly zero value, actually negative value, but whatever the cost is of all that work has been achieved. Okay? Value is in the eye of the beholder. It's in the hands of the customer, not declared by the team producing the potential value. This is the DA Flex life cycle. This is a, um, for those of you familiar with the life cycle, this is a an improvement, um, you basically put this in your track in, um, so we're in the process of, uh, of releasing this. But anyways, the idea here is everything begins and ends the customer, goes through all these activities, and then back, and then hopefully continues. So your first release, first effort, tends to be a little more effort up front, because you, you got to make a decision what we're going to do, what we're going to do, and, 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 and whether we're going to do it. And the work gets done, gets in the hands of your uh, customers, hopefully. Hopefully they buy it, pay for it, they leverage it, whatever. Um, and then we get into smaller changes, and hopefully we're in this sort of life cycle. So the idea here is we've got to look at the whole thing. This has all got to fit together. If the strategy of the portfolio management folks, if they're off doing whatever it is that they're doing, and it doesn't reflect the reality down here, or and vice versa, you got a problem. Is anything done upstream, if it's no good, well, that stuff just floats downstream, right? So we've got to be looking at the whole picture. We've got to be optimizing the whole picture. If this group is really, really efficient, and this group here is a disaster, who cares? It's the overall flow that counts. So sometimes, I have, to, I have to do what's inconvenient here or in any of these hex, hexes in order to enable them to be more effective because it's the overall picture, the overall way that we're working together is what counts. So we've got to get out of the local optimization effort. This is one of the challenges with bodies of knowledge, by the way. Um, I, no, we're not showing data management, I'll pick up the data folks again because that's what they like to do. I'm um, not showing the data management uh, process play here. But they've got their body of knowledge, as do the enterprise architects, as do the program managers, and so on, and so on, and so on. Take a wild guess how well all those bodies of knowledge fit together. Not well, because they're all the center of the universe. 
You talk to the marketing people and you ask them, who's the most important group in your organization? And it's marketing. Talk to the finance group. Who's the most important group in your organization? And it's finance. Talk to the PMO. Who's the most important group in your organization? It's the PMO. <laughs> of course. Right? Um, so fair enough. We all can't be at the center of the universe. Unfortunately. Well, maybe the customers can. I don't know. That would be an interesting conversation. So, interestingly, remember that slide I showed earlier about what the PMOs potentially do? PMOs are potentially involved with some of this, but not all of this. Might not be a good position to be in. Because this is all about value delivery, and if your PMO is not delivering value, uh-oh, uh-oh. So, that leads me to value delivery offices. So, if we look at the PMBOK guide, in the new, you know, seventh edition at least, there's a lot of great principles there. Several of them are very clearly focused on value. Several of them are very clearly well aligned with what I was just talking about. You know, embracing adaptability and resiliency, enabling change. Things are going to change. Get used to it. Oops. Um, tailoring, based on your context. Context counts. Different teams will work in different situations. Focusing on value, absolutely critical. You need to focus on value. You've got to look at the entire value stream, not just the portion that you want to. Right. So, a value delivery office. And here's a, an area where we're still in unfortunate lack of terminology land. Some people call these value management offices. This is a book, really well written book, from PMO to VMO. Um, by Sanjeev Augustine and a few others. <coughs> Incredibly well written forward, by the way. If you want to entertain forward, it's, uh, that's a good book for that. But having said that, uh, I personally prefer the term VDO because I would rather deliver, I want to focus on value delivery rather than value management. But, you know, that's a, a quibble. Um, but it's, it'll be a wonderful, wonderful uh, religious debate for the next 10 years, I suspect. Um, but, anyways. You work in context, you know, VDOs focus on delivering value. They focus on context. If you remember that slide with all the different ways of working, all the different life cycles, that's the reality on the ground. Now, you might not have all eight of those underway at the present moment, or you might. <laughs> I don't know. You certainly got a subset of them, and that's okay. Right? We need to be able to govern lightly. I was talking for a bit about governance in a couple minutes. And enable hybrid work in a hybrid environment and motivate true predictability. I'm hoping to tick off about every single person in the audience here. I'm gonna go, I'm a firm believer in not only shooting sacred cows, but serving them back up to his hamburgers. So, but it's Texas, right? You guys love your beef. So, yeah. Your so lean governance, what is this lean governance stuff? You got a boatload of information about lean governance in DA. Governance is not a swear word for us. Many in the agile community it is, and that's a real shame. You are being governed. I believe you deserve to be governed well. I, I can also observe that in most cases you are not being governed well. And this isn't just an organizational thing, but we won't go there. Um, but anyways, what's lean governance? Lean governance is focused on motivation and enablement. I want to motivate you to do the right thing, and then I want to enable you, whatever the right thing happens to be for your organization and your situation, and then I want to enable you to do the right thing. I want to make it as easy as possible to do the right thing, and probably make it rather difficult to do the wrong thing. And then people will ne people are lazy. It's human behavior to take the easy path in most cases, and they will. So let's make the easy path, or let's make the right path the easy path. Let's make the not so right path or the wrong path the hard path. Make it easy to do the right thing. Chances are exceptionally good people. Well, if you make it difficult to do the right thing, if you force people to jump through quality gates, to fill in templates, and to you know sacrifice goats and look at the entrails, you know, whatever your whatever your governance process happens to be, chances are they're gonna fake it. Right? Chances are they're going to fake it. Now, I'm not going to ask this question. Actually, let me reword this. How many of you 
Have friends, not yourself, of course, because you're all good decent people, you would never do this. But how many of you have heard about evil people who sometimes work on projects and in order to get through the governance process, they create artifacts solely to get through the process and then they never look at them again. How many people have heard of people like you in this book, right? How many people, and of those friends, not you, how many people have been caught doing that? <laughs> because the governors aren't governing. And they're not being governed. Who's governing the governors in your organization? <coughs> Nobody. Yeah. Okay. So why are the governors not being governed? Well, it's hard. <laughs> uh, that's a problem, right? Think about that. And well, by the way, that's of course built into DA. It's, I like asking hard questions like that. So the goals and so the goals of lean government, spend the money wisely. Motivating people to work together effectively. Working in an open and collaborative manner. That can be tough. Making sure that this will continue to be true. And of course, some of you are in situations, if you're working uh, for the military, for example, you might not be allowed to be as open, right? So you gotta. You know, everything's context dependent, of course. Um, it is what it is. But don't inflict crazy rules on your people for the sheer joy of it. I've worked in companies where you can't take snapshots of whiteboards. Really? Or clean desk rules. Remember that nonsense from the 90s? That's the problem. You would throw things out. Wow, what a useless bureaucracy. But anyways, but you had pretty desks, that would count, right? Uh, and yeah, you know, if you're working in a, you know, if you're working in a top secret organization, fine. If you're working for an insurance company. I worked in a company once. We couldn't put sticky notes on the windows because they were afraid that somebody with a telephoto lens, <laughs> half a mile away, were going to take pictures of our sticky notes reversed through the window because my team, which is working on the website, was doing some top secret thing. And you know, we were going to spill the beans somehow. And we we're releasing once a week in a production. Right? So anyways, yeah, crazy stuff. Um, so we ignored We ignored those people. <laughs> what can you do? Right? Okay. So what is the mindset for governance? So remember how earlier I showed you the, uh, the disadvantaged mindset and told you how you know, the government, the finance people, and the data people, the security people all come to the table with their way of looking at things? Well, so do the governance people. So indeed, we're flexible. We respect the fact that different people come to the, to the table with a different way of looking at things. So we have philosophies that are specific to each blade. So if the governance folks are working in an effective manner, they're hopefully coming to the table with this sort of a mindset. They believe in holistic governance. They're looking at the bigger picture, not just security governance, not just financial governance. But all aspects of governance, because it's got to fit in. All got to fit together, right? They believe in enablement over audit. Yes, you're still probably going to be audited. If you're in a regulatory environment, you're going to be audited. It is what it is. You don't have to be stupid about it. We should trust but verify. We should be motivating rather than managing. Trust your people. You got a lot of really smart people on staff. They don't need to be managed. You know, most of them don't need to be managed. They might need to be prodded along a bit. Might need to be helped a bit. Do they need to be managed? In most cases, no. And if they do, that's probably an indication they need some training or mentoring. That's maybe what you should be doing rather than telling them what to do. Instead, enabling them to fend for themselves. Right. So in DA, we don't tell you what to do. So remember, Earlier, saying yeah, we don't tell you what to do, we tell you what to think about. Well, this is the way we do it. This is called a process goal diagram. So, when it comes to governance, these are some of the things you need to think about. How am I going to develop guidance for people to follow? How are we going to define the roles and responsibilities in an organization? How are we going to address enterprise risk? Because it's really, you know, things that are low risk at the team level can add up to a major risk at the enterprise level, right? How do we govern the governance team? Ooh, there's a concept. How do we guide the measurement program? And so on. There's different options here. There's different ways we can approach measurement within an organization. Yeah, OKRs are, 
or a you know, popular fad at the present moment, and GKM was a popular fad a couple decades ago, but they're all good. We're doing lightweight versions of them, right? So do the best you can, KPIs and so on, right? Do the best you can, situation that you face. When you see an arrow on this diagram, that's an indication the strategies towards the top of the list are generally more effective than the strategies towards the bottom of the list. When there's no arrow, then all we can do is tell you the trade-off techniques. So it's sort of a maturity model you know, for the process of optimize. It's a continuous maturity model, to be more exact. So you've got choices. How do you lead? How do you, act, act, you know, if you're, a, if you're an executive, if you are on the governance team or leading the VEO, how do you, you know, what are the types of behaviors that we expect to see? And as you can see, there's detailed articles in the DA toolkit on all these, all really available free of charge. What types of strategies do I expect a lean government? So we, like I said, we want to empower teams. We want to provide a common, lightweight, consumable guidance to people. We want to have automated dashboards. I want to be automating all of my metrics and automate all the roll-up of those metrics. I don't trust manually generated metrics, period. I don't trust status reports written by people, period. The best thing that I can say about status reports is when I'm in an audit position, any team that's still producing status reports by hand, thank you for identifying the team, identifying yourself, because I know you've got a problem here. And I'm going to look at you hard. You're collecting metrics. Yeah, there's a few metrics we've got to generate manually, is what it is. But they, they better be the exception and not the rule. Right? Uh, because status reports are wonderful works of fiction. <laughs> yeah. They rarely have the key information that you want. Um, so in that way, they are good at it. If I didn't go look at that crap, or maybe I do because I'm probably not hearing the real story on that one. <laughs> but uh, certainly got a problem there. We should be about defining roles and responsibilities. And these are going to evolve over time. And they're going to vary based on the situation. The role of team lead on a serial team will be very different than on an agile lean team, or on an agile or lean team, for example. How do we deliver in a hybrid environment? Just to sort of wrap things up here. So earlier we talked about trucking code. Remember that three different, very different projects or very different initiatives underway? I think only the, the building thing was really a project. Um, I think yeah, it's one of those situations where the, the gridiron one, where they were installing hardware, they thought it was a project, but then went on for a long, long time. Things went poorly. It's, you know, truckers. Uh, it's, you know, harder pro it's a simple thing, right? Always a harder problem, you think. Um, so how do you measure across these teams? So <clears throat> the point here is that different teams will measure different things. They're working in different ways. They have different concerns. So they should be collecting different types of metrics. Now, sometimes there's some commonality across teams, and that's OK. Sometimes there's not. Like I said, I can measure quality on those three very different teams, but it would be done in very different ways. But I can still measure quality. I can still, I can still roll up quality measures in some way to do, their, you know, do the red light, green light thing at some point. Notice how there's earned value here on the serial team. Earn value on the Agile team, eh, not such a good idea, right? That's okay, different teams, different situations. We'll measure in different ways. I get very concerned when I hear, when I hear organizations asking for, you know, tell me the top 10 metrics to collect. What? what, are you, what are you, what's important to you? What are you trying to, are you trying to improve quality? I'll improve quality, I'll measure quality. Here's how I can potentially measure quality in a different situation. Oh, well, you want to improve time to market? Well, here's potential metrics for that. So different teams, different priorities will measure in different ways. Now, you might have some priorities that you inflict across all your teams, but show me how you're improving time to market. And then my team will have to figure out how to measure time to market and roll it up to the portfolio dashboard. Your team, which is a very different team, will also have to measure time to market and roll that up, because it's probably an interested trend in trends, probably interested in trends at all levels, but anyway. So, point is, different teams working in different ways in different situations will measure in different ways. 
one size does not fit all. We also have the issue, but how do we govern? So one aspect of governance that we bake in is risk-based milestones, not artifact-based. So instead of telling, telling teams, jump through these quality gates, fill out these templates, and we'll bless them in a certain way, instead what we do is we say, I need you to, you know, where appropriate, to address those risks in an appropriate manner. So a team building an internal website will address the proven architecture risk in a very different way than the team building a pacemaker. Rightfully <coughs> so. The team that is building the software for the trucks will, will prove their architecture and will, or will, will achieve a stakeholder vision in a different way than the team that's building the building. Because the team that's building the building, there's a few regulatory concerns there. I hope. The local governing, you know, the local government probably likes buildings not to fall down. I hope. Um, in, I, I'm from Canada. Uh, it's, uh, we have a scandal going on about a bridge that fell down in Saskatchewan, one of our small provinces, uh, uh, a while ago. Almost no regulations in place. Right? It's one of those libertarian, you know, no big government nonsense. Well, you start removing regulations and eventually things start to fall down. But anyways, that's okay. Hopefully they laugh. Yeah, I know. Uh, you never know. You never know. They might win. Um, and just stand up here. This is what this is what's going to throw oh, some people for a loop. Is what does it mean to be predictable? The holy grail of project management: predictability. <laughs> Predictive is not predictable. By the way, those are two different words. Look them up in the dictionary. Interesting implication of the word predictive. But. Okay, so I'm sure you're familiar with the traditional iron triangle, right? We all know that we shouldn't be committing to all three of these things at once, right? If you commit to something on time, on budget, to specification, quality is guaranteed to give. This is certainly one of the few laws of physics in the IT space, and I suspect it's also a law of physics in the actual physical space as well. Now, all three. Uh, but now, the idea with the Iron Triangle, and this is Project Management 101, I'm preaching to the choir, I hope. At least one of those must be allowed to vary, otherwise you've got a very serious problem on your hand. By, by fixing all those, you dramatically increase the risk on your project. Ideally, you want to let all three vary. Now, that requires the confidence to actually execute on, but I really want all three of those to vary if I want to do a good job. And if I can, right, it's the capability challenge. So, how do we look at it in the DA world? Well, I really want to look at value, not just, obviously quality is an aspect of value, but it's really about delivering value, with quality being an important aspect of value, sufficient quality being an important aspect of value. But instead of talking about building something to spec, I really want to build or produce what they need because their needs will change. The environment, if, if COVID has taught us anything, things change sometimes dramatically. People's understanding of what they want changes. People are not good at telling us what they want. They're reasonably good at telling us what they don't like after they see it. <laughs> but they might not be able to tell us why other than, I don't like that green. I have no idea what color it should be, but green is no good. Okay, thanks. <laughs> thanks. So, we really need to focus on stickles, which means we need, to iter uh, we need to iterate. We need to work incrementally. Not just the to the end. I'm not that concerned about hitting a date. I am concerned about having re regular releases. Like I said, those teams that were releasing once a week into production or into the marketplace, nobody asks them what your schedule is anyway. All that nonsense just goes away. If you're on a six month project, yeah, somebody's keeping an eye on the schedule because they know you're probably going to blow it, particularly in the IT space. 
right? Or yeah, even in the building space, but uh, certainly in the tangible space. So if I can release regularly, all that stuff goes away because it's been phenomenally easy to predict when we're going to release, when we're going to actually deliver new value. And being on budget, it's more of a sucker's game than anything else in my mind. I want to spend the money wisely. Right? I've got a daughter. She gets an allowance. I don't just hand her money and hope for the best. I keep an eye on what's going on. Right? Now, she's in the stage, currently she buys books and stuff like that. And she actually buys manga. But, and, you know, my wife's not impressed. I think it's awesome. <laughs> but anyway, she's buying books. That's a good thing, right? So that's spending the money wisely in my mind. I should be giving her more money, which I do, right? I've got a, I've got a general rule of thumb. If she ever comes and asks ask for money for a book, here it goes. Why not, right? Now, if she is going out and buying cigarettes, I'm going to start pulling that money back, right? So she's got, you know, she's got her, she's got her allowance budget right now. But if she's spending it wisely, I can start throwing more money at it. She starts buying bad things, suddenly the, the bank of dad disappears. Right? I want to invest the money wisely. I don't care how much money well, you know, certainly there's limits. <laughs> but um, we haven't hit them yet. But uh, certainly there will be limits. But I want to make sure she's spending the money wisely. Right? That's the important thing. Same thing on your projects. Oh, you came in a million dollars. Well, what value did you deliver? I don't care how much money you spent. You could have thrown that money away. I'm, not, I'm involved with a project right now. They're just throwing money away. I would rather, like, literally, I, I'm, I'm at the point, I'd rather just get a stack of bills and flush it down the toilet and film it and put it on YouTube. It'd be a hell of a lot better than what I'm getting for the, for the money right now. Because they're not spending it wisely. But they are on budget. So yeah, so this shift from two spec to what people actually need, from being on time to releasing regularly, from being on budget to investing wisely, these are all nuances, but they're important nuances. And what's interesting, when you speak with the executives, you ask them what's really important, more so we're going to be there. And most of you as managers are probably already there too. You might, be, you might perceive that you're not able to actually be allowed to invest wisely because you've had a budget forced on you or whatever. But you can change. You can choose to evolve. You've got a new target now. So if you're still doing this sort of stuff, okay, fine. But you can, over the next few years, you can work with your organization to evolve to this. And that's what the successful organizations are doing now. So just to wrap up, because I know I am between you and coffee. I'm between me and coffee, yes. You know the issue. Uh, how do we learn more? PMI is all about helping you to work smarter, be successful in your careers, to become change makers, to actually be effective at what you're doing. A lot of great material, a uh, lot of great opportunities for you. So if I was a project manager today, and I wanted to get into more agile stuff, what's my career path? Well, I can become an agile project manager. Right? So I can start taking some of the micro credits. If I can get my ACP, that's a good career path, right? Move from being a traditional project manager to being an agile project manager. One that's not talked about as much is becoming a product owner. Because that, you know, if you look at the skills of a product owner, you gotta be a really good manager, plus have some business, solid business analysis skills that gets down to it. So this is a heck of a career path. I, I've seen a lot of PMs move into being product owners and absolutely loving what they do. So it's an opportunity. Might want to become a coach. So the coaching path, become a team coach. Be your DASSM. Then become a senior coach. Be your DA coach. Learn to coach across teams. And eventually become an enterprise coach. Become a value stream consultant. That's a heck of a career path as well. And it's a multi-year career path because you have that experience at all those levels. Or you might want to become a scrum master. That's a commodity skill. But, you know, whatever, whatever floats your boat, right? Um, but certainly that's a good, good start of other things as well. So the point I want to make is that there's many opportunities for PMs to learn, to get better, to improve, just like we heard just before my talk. 
I just wanted to point that out. And hopefully PMI can help you on your journey. So thank you very much. I'm easy to find on social media. I'm also on a panel later on this afternoon, so if you've got some hard questions, I'm happy to stay around uh, for those of you who are not coffee addicted like I am. But uh, that's okay. So thank you. Thank you very much. We really appreciate it. Since we are an extra minute, we'll go ahead and break for coffee. Can you bring your questions to the panel this afternoon? Thank you very much. Thank you.